Thank you. Thanks very much. I was just, uh, I was thinking as I came in that, um, like, whenever you go and speak anywhere, there's this, like, cliche you have to say, which is, uh, I'm really proud to be here, it's really privileged, blah, blah, blah. And um, I was thinking, actually, this is a place where that's really sincere. Um, I really do feel privileged to be here. Where, everywhere I went in the world, where they've made any progress on this, people talked about Merseyside and Liverpool as a place that inspired them, where something had changed and where they knew that things could get better because of what had happened here. I know there's a lot of people here who have worked in this field, particularly when it was really hard to work in this field. I know it's true of here, I know it's true of Pat. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to say is that you've saved a lot of people's lives, not just here in Merseyside, but across the world because of the work that you've done. And I'm, I feel really privileged to talk alongside Steve, who I've known for a really long time, who's doing some of the most important work in the world on showing how we end the drug war. What I wanted to talk about was, um, uh, really, how do we change the drug debate in Britain? How do we get, because there's a lot of people with a lot of doubts about the existing policy, but we have not got traction for a significant change in the way that's happened even in the United States. You know, I'll give you one example. Alaska has legalized marijuana. We are now less progressive than the state that elected Sarah Palin, right? To give you some idea where we are. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. The, the, the reason I started working on the book is um, I realized we were coming up to 100 years since drugs were first banned. For, about four years ago, I realized we we're coming up to it. This is now the centenary. And I thought I knew quite a lot about this issue, you know, for several reasons. One is, um, one of my earliest memories was of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, and as I got older, realising we had addiction in my family. Um, and it was something I wrote about a lot as well uh, as a journalist, and I kind of realised that there were loads of just really basic questions that I didn't know the answer to. Like, why did we go to war against drug users 100 years ago? Why do we continue when so many people think it doesn't work? What do the alternatives really look like in practice? And what really causes drug addiction? And I couldn't find the answers in what I was reading. And I, I think part of the problem was that this, this issue is discussed too often, definitely not by the people here, but too often, as if it's kind of abstract philosophical question. What would drug legalization mean? Or, you know, like a kind of grand abstraction. And I didn't want to think of it that way. I wanted to go and sit with real people whose lives have been changed by this one way or another and tell their stories and relate it to the best evidence. I want to start just with two stories about the end of the war on drugs, two very different places, which both begin in the year 2000. I went to both of them quite a long time later. In the year 2000, in the downtown east side of Vancouver, there was a homeless street addict called Bud Osborne. I know there's people here who've been to the downtown east side, people who haven't been. It had, the highest had and has the highest concentration of addicts in North America, quite possibly in the world. It's the place at the end of the line, in the city at the end of the line of North America. And Bud was watching his friends die all around him. Basically what would happen is, because they had quite tight drug policing, uh, people would shoot up behind dumpsters so the cops wouldn't see them. But obviously if shooting up and you're hiding, so the police can't see you and no one sees you. If you start to overdose, your body gets found a few days later, you're dead. And Bud thought, I can't just watch this happen, right? I can't just see all my friends die and then die himself. But he also thought, these are the words he would have used, I'm a homeless junkie, what can I do? And Bud had a really simple idea, it was really simple. He got together a group of the addicts and he said, when we're not using, which obviously is most of the time even for quite hardcore addicts, let's do something really simple. No one official, we won't get the police, we won't get any health workers, nothing like that. We'll just patrol the alleyways, we'll have a timetable, we'll patrol the alleyways, and when we spot someone overdosing, we'll ring an ambulance, right? So the people were a little bit sceptical, but they signed up. They started to do it. Within a couple of months, the overdose rate, the deaths from overdose rate of the downtown east side started to significantly fall, which was really great in itself, obviously, because people were living who would otherwise have died. But also it meant the addicts started to think, ah, oh, maybe we're not the pieces of shit everyone says we are. Maybe we can do something. They started to turn up at the uh, public meetings about like the menace of the addicts. And they'd sit at the back and people would talk about how evil they were. And about halfway through, Bud or someone would put up their hand and go, oh, I think you're talking about us. Is there anything we could do differently? And sometimes people would be very angry, sometimes they'd be relieved. Uh, sometimes they'd say things like, well, you leave your needles lying around. And Bud said, that's fine. We'll extend the patrols, we'll collect the needles. They started doing that. And there was a subtle change in how people thought about addicts. But the addicts who then formed a group called Van Du thought, uh, we need to be more organized about this. They started to, Bud and several of them started to research in the library and they discovered that in Frankfurt, they'd open safe injecting rooms where addicts could be monitored while they're used, and the overdose rate had fallen even more dramatically. 
And so they said, well, we've got to have that here. But there had been nothing like that in North America since the birth of the drug war, since the 1930s. And they thought, well, we're going to do it. The mayor of Vancouver at the time was a guy called Philip Owen, who was a rich, very right-wing businessman who said that drug addicts should be taken and detained at the local military base and never let out. If you picture Mitt Romney, you've got kind of, like, picture him and you've got Philip Owen in your head. He was not a likely ally for drug users in any way. And Bud and his friends started to stalk Philip Owen everywhere he went, and they would turn up with a coffin. And the coffin said on it, who will die next, Philip Owen, before you open a safe injecting room? And this goes on for two years, and Philip Owen is baffled, and they turn up and they say things at public meetings like, do you remember the last person who said, who will, you, who, who will die next before you open a safe injecting room, Philip Owen? She's actually dead now, because you haven't opened a safe injecting room yet. And after two years, totally to his credit, Philip Owen says, who the fuck are these people? And he goes incognito to the downtown east side, and he met loads of addicts who he'd never met before. He never spent any time with addicts. And he was totally blown away. He was like, oh, this is not what I expected. These are just suffering people with shitty lives who need help. He then went to meet Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, not someone I would normally praise, but he was really good on this issue, because partly because he'd grown up in Chicago under alcohol prohibition. And Philip Owen went back to Vancouver and he held a press conference. And he had the chief of police and he had the coroner and he had a representative of the addicts. And he said, I will never speak again about addiction without having a representative of the addicts here and we're going to open the first safe injecting room in North America. He said they were going to have the most compassionate drug policies in North America. And they opened it. It's called Insight. It looks a bit like a branch of Tony and Guy. Uh, you go in and it's like this neat little uh, cubicles where you, you go and shoot up. And um, Philip Owen's party was so horrified, right-wing party, that they deselected him and his political career ended. But the right-wing candidate they chose was then beaten by a left-wing candidate who kept the injecting room open. And when I went to the downtown east side, it was 10 years since the injecting room had first opened. And uh, the results were in. Deaths from overdose are down by 80%. And average life expectancy on the downtown east side is up by 10 years. You don't get epidemiological figures like that except when a war ends, which is what this is. And <clears throat> I went and interviewed Philip Owen. Uh, and we interviewed him on the downtown east side, and people spontaneously interrupted our interview to thank him for what he'd done. And he said it was the proudest thing he'd ever done. And if he, he would sacrifice his entire political career all over again. And Bud, who started the uprising, he died. I, I interviewed him a lot. He died last year. And um, when he died, they sealed off the streets of the downtown east side where he had lived as a homeless person. And they had this incredible memorial service. And there were lots of people in that, that crowd who knew they were alive because of what he had done. So I know that there's people here who've worked in this field for a long time, and it's very easy to feel uh, this is such a massive battle. What I would say is, you know, we are much more powerful than we think when we organise. You know, it's hard to think of a more disempowered person than a homeless street addict. And he didn't wait for any leaders, he didn't wait for permission from anyone, he just started. And at the same time that Bud was uh, living on the streets of the downtown east side, in Portugal, something else was happening. They had um, one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin. It was kind of mind-blowing. And every year, they tried the American way more and more. They arrested more people. They imprisoned more people. They um, squandered more money on making addicts' lives worse. And every year, the addiction problem got worse. And uh, one day, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition got together. And they basically said, look, we can't, we can't go on like this. What are we going to do? And they did something really smart. They decided to set up a panel of scientists and doctors. They said, go away, figure out what would genuinely solve this problem, come back. But crucially, they got the political parties to agree in advance that they would do whatever the panel recommended. It just took the issue out of politics. So the panel goes away, led by an amazing man called, man called Hua Goulao, who had opened the first drug treatment center in Portugal in the 80s. And they looked at all the evidence, they did a huge amount of research, and they came back and they said, decriminalize all drugs, from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we used to spend on arresting and imprisoning drug users and drug addicts, and spend it all on reconnecting them with the society. And it's really important, it was fascinating going and seeing this. What they've done is not quite what we think of as drug treatment. Um, they do have residential rehab. Um, they have outstanding harm reduction, low threshold methadone, um, very good stuff like that. But the single biggest part of the program and the bit that the people there regard as the most successful was 
job, uh, guaranteed jobs for addicts and micro loans for addicts to set up businesses. So say you used to be a mechanic, they will uh, go to a garage if you're ready and they'll say if you employ this guy for a year we'll pay half his wages. The goal of the Portuguese decriminalisation was to make sure that every addict in Portugal had something to get out of bed for in the morning. Uh, they did microloans for addicts. So, for example, there was a, a group of, I think it was 14 addicts who were given a microloan to set up a removals firm. Suddenly, they have this huge investment in all their friends not falling apart because you've got 14 people who are hugely invested. It was very low thresh, um, low interest, I think virtually no interest microloans, stuff like that. And again, when I was there, the results were in. It's nearly 15, it'll be 15 years this year since the decriminalisation. Uh, and, and, and the figures are pretty clear. Injecting drug use is down by 50%, 5-0%. Overall addiction is down. Deaths from overdose are massively down. HIV transmission is massively down. But one of the ways, HIV transmission among addicts, injecting drug users, I should say. Um, the, uh, but one of the ways you know it's been so successful is I went and interviewed a guy called Juan, virtually no one wants to go back. I went and interviewed a guy called Juan Figuera, who led the opposition to the decriminalisation. He's the top drug cop in Portugal. And um, he said a lot of the things at the time that you would expect, not just the Daily Mail, but like a lot of reasonable people to say, surely if you decriminalise all drugs, you'll have all sorts of problems. And he said to me, the exact words are in the book, but I think this is right, everything I said would happen didn't happen. And everything the other side said would happen did. And he talked about how he felt ashamed that he'd spent 20 years before the decriminalisation arresting and harassing drug users and it didn't work. And he talked also about the huge fall in street crime and... Uh, and, and he said he hoped the whole world followed Portugal's example. It was fascinating going to other places. I went to a place where they have a place where they tried legalisation, which I can get to later. But the um, it led me to, going to these places. I'd, I'd been thinking already before I went about you know why did this start right? Why did we begin with this strategy a hundred years ago? And if you'd asked me beforehand, I would have guessed that the reasons they gave for banning drugs in the US and then it's imposed on the rest of the world were pretty much the reasons that, you know, if you stopped an average person on the street, they would give for the drug war. You know, you don't want kids to use drugs, you don't want people to become addicted. What's so striking is that's really not why the drug wars began. We all have this kind of, um, well, not all of us, but a lot of us, including me, have a kind of assumption that at some point someone sat down and did, like, rational cost-benefit analysis and that's why things were introduced. That's not what happened. Um, what happened in America is there was an enormous race panic. If you look through the, the, the debates at the time, it's kind of mind-blowing. I went through the files of the main people involved, and um, there was a very widespread belief that African Americans and Chinese Americans were forgetting their place, taking drugs, and attacking white people. It's very deeply believed. Um, the official statement saying things like, the cocaine N-word sure is hard to kill. The official reason why the caliber of bullets was increased in a lot of areas in the United States for police officers was because they believed that black people were using cocaine and were gaining superhuman strength. Um, the way I tell it in my book is through the story of how Billie Holiday, the great jazz singer, was, was stalked and killed by the man who launched the war on drugs, Harry Anslinger. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about that because I think it tells you about something about what's going on with these dynamics and what was really driving the drug war. In 1939, she stood on stage in New York City uh, and she sang the song Strange Fruit for the first time, the song against lynching. And uh, you've got to understand how shocking this was. You know, she's standing in front of a white audience at a time when there are no political pop songs in a hotel where she wasn't allowed to walk through the front door. She had to go through the service elevator because she was African-American. And she sings this song. And that night, according to her biographer, Julia Blackburn, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics tells her to stop singing that song. And when I found that, I was like, this is really weird. Why is why are the Narcotics Bureau telling her where, what song she can sing and what song she can't sing? The Federal Bureau of Narcotics at the same time found out that Billie Holiday and Judy Garland, uh, Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, were heroin addicts, right? They told Judy Garland to take slightly longer vacations and reassured the studio she was going to be fine. Judy Garland is white. With Billie Holiday, they resolved, when she effectively said, screw you, I'm going to sing my song, they resolved to destroy her. He sent a guy to, um, he, he really hated employing black people, but you couldn't really send a white guy into Harlem to stalk Billie Holiday. It'd be kind of obvious. So he employed this black agent called, called Jimmy Fletcher, who follows Billie Holiday around for two years, takes these incredibly elaborate notes on everything. Actually, Billie Holiday was so amazing, he fell in love with her, and his whole life he felt ashamed of what he did. He has her busted. Um, she, she, got, she gets put on trial. She said the trial was called the United States versus Billie Holiday, and that's how it felt. She's sent to prison. She doesn't sing a word in prison, but what happens next is the worst bit. She gets out, and she can't sing because you needed a license to perform anywhere where alcohol was served. 
And that meant almost everywhere in New York. And they had it denied to her. This is what we do to addicts every day all over the world. We cut them off from their sources of meaning. We make it really hard for them to ever work again in the legal economy. Unsurprisingly, Billie Holiday relapses. When she's in her early 40s, she collapses in New York. She's taken to hospital. And the hospital refuses to take her because she's an addict. So she's taken to another hospital where they do let her in. And she's convinced that these narcotics agents aren't finished with her, one of her friends. She says to one of her friends, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them, they're going to kill me. She's taken into hospital. She's diagnosed with very bad liver cancer. She had serious alcohol problems as well as heroin problems. And um, they handcuff her to the bed and they arrest her on her deathbed. One, she goes into withdrawal. One of her friends manages to insist she's given methadone. methadone. She's given it for 10 days and she starts to recover and then they cut it off and she dies. One of her friends said she looked like she had been violently wrenched from life. And I think that story about the birth of the drug war tells us a lot about the dynamics driving it, how much it's about race, how much it was about race, and including in Britain, you know, when you look at the earliest, a very good book called Dope Girls by Marek Cohn, I think the guy's name is, um, looks at how much, you look at the, the headlines uh, in Britain when drugs are banned, you know, there's one, so the News of the World headline, something like, uh, I don't want to say the word, N-word musicians spread dope, and the word musicians was put in inverted commas, but not the N-word. Um, this is really racist and massive driving factor, and it's really striking today. Um, the United States has a much higher disparity, racial disparity in, in drug arrests than apartheid South Africa did, which is in itself mind-blowing when you know that uh, we know the evidence that African Americans are no more likely to sell drugs than anyone else. There's only one country in the world that has a worse racial disparity, and that's us which tells you something, I think. Um, Harry Anslinger, the guy who led the stalking of, of Billie Holiday, um, he once was challenged and he said, I've made up my mind, don't try to confuse me with the facts, which I think is like the perfect uh, motto for the drug policy that we have at the moment. Um, the, I just want to talk about a couple of other things. The, the, um, there's another person that Harry Anslinger resolved to destroy. So he's the guy who invents the modern drug war. He takes over the Department of Alcohol Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition is ending. So he's got to find a purpose for his department. And he really invents a lot of the modern beliefs about drugs, including the false beliefs about cannabis. But also he, he, uh, he really invents the machinery of it. You know, of course, he's riding waves of fears that are already existing in the culture. He plays a huge role through the League of Nations and then the UN in imposing it on other countries, including Britain. And one thing that really struck me is when, he, when drugs are first banned and then he massively steps it up, this was hugely disputed. There were enormous numbers of people, especially doctors, who saw incredibly presciently everything that was going to come. There was a doctor in California called Henry Smith Williams who wrote a book called Drug Addicts Are Human Beings where he predicts everything that was coming. He says at one point, we wouldn't do this because it would be so crazy, but if we carried on with this policy for another 50 years, 50 years from now, we'll have a $5 billion smuggling industry in the United States. He was right to almost the exact year. And what Henry Smith Williams saw, he had treated drug addicts when drugs were legal and then when drugs were illegal. And of course, when drugs were legal, these addicts had depleted and diminished lives in the way that alcoholics do today. But what really, and this is a guy, a guy who was not particularly sympathetic to drug addicts, it's quite a kind of social Darwinian. But when he saw prohibition kick in, and especially when it stepped up, he was horrified because what he saw is these addicts who used to go to the local pharmacy and buy their drugs pretty cheaply suddenly have to go to armed criminal gangsters selling disgusting contaminated products. So there's that whole wave of crime that's created around, uh, you know, the fact that the trade is transferred from legal people to illegal people who have to protect their product using guns. He saw that, but then he also saw the, what happened to the addicts. Huge increase in their death toll, massive. Um, the, the, he saw that the, you know, the men often turned to property crime because the dealers massively increased their prices. The, the dealers start to um, you know, massively increase their, uh, yeah, the dealers increase the price. So he starts, the, the men often turn to property crime and the women often turn to prostitution. There had actually been an official government study looking at addicts just prior to the drug war kicking in. It's really interesting reading. They almost all had jobs. They were no more likely to be poor than anyone else. It's a really fascinating dynamic of how quickly they deteriorated after prohibition begins. Harry Anslinger has this doctor completely destroyed. He has his brother. There, was, there had to be 17,000 doctors were so committed to opposing this terrible policy when it first began that they had to be uh, criminally arrested. You know, because they carried on. 
Uh, it's one of the biggest roundups of medical professionals in American history. It's been virtually written out of American history, but it's really striking. The mayor of Los Angeles stood in front of a heroin prescribing clinic and said effectively, you're not going to shut this down. This does a good job for the people of Los Angeles. So it's really striking how much people saw right at the start what this was going to do, especially since they could see alcohol prohibition in practice. They knew what that meant. Um, and it was really interesting seeing the kind of echoes. So when, when Anslinger was shutting down that doctor, Henry Smith Williams, one place, and he then imposes it on the rest of the world, sometimes in very brutal ways. So for example, Mexico had a really good doctor who was in charge of their drug policy, and he said, cannabis isn't that harmful, and drug addicts need compassionate care, right? Pretty good policy. It would be pretty progressive for someone to say that now. Um, and Anslinger said, you've got to fire this guy. And Mexico refused. And so the, the United States cut off the supply of legal opiates to Mexico for pain relief. So, you know, the stuff they used in, in healthcare. So people in Mexico were writhing in agony in the hospitals in Mexico until they fired the guy and adopted the American drug war approach with all the catastrophic results that I saw in Mexico today. Um, there's one place that held out, and it's very interesting, and you got a lot of people in this room know better than me. The place that held out was Britain. The doctors here, partly because they had a degree of autonomy, just said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to drive all our addicts to, to, um, to dealers. We're not going to do that. Um, and the way I tell the story in that is through, uh, and Pat really helped me to understand this along with several other people I interviewed, through the story of John Marks and the incredible experiment that happened in the Wirral near here. In 1982, John Marks gets a job in a clinic uh, in the Wirral, a GP surgery. And he turns up, and he, he's particularly interested in schizophrenia. It was kind of his intellectual interest. And he turns up, and he's given the job of like dealing with you know, certain patients by the other people in the practice. And he's amazed to discover that part of this is there are 20 people in this clinic who have been given a heroin script, a heroin prescription. And he thinks, well, this is crazy. You're giving out free heroin on the NHS. This is a really bad idea. Um, he had inherited the first wrinkle, that wrinkle in the drug war that, that had held out from British doctors right at the start of the drug war, just insisting this had continued ever since, in diminishing numbers, but it was still there. And so John called in the addicts to, with a mind to say, look, the party's over, you're going to have to stop this. And John was really struck by something. These heroin addicts didn't look anything like any of the heroin addicts he'd ever met. They didn't have any wounds, they didn't have any abscesses. They looked indistinguishable from the receptionists and the doctors. They all had jobs, almost all had jobs. Um, he was really struck by this. And he commissioned a study by Russell Newcomb, a brilliant academic here in Liverpool, uh, to just look at, look at this, look at the results. And Russell came back and basically had found, wow, th there were really good health outcomes. And so John, after a while, decided to expand this program to embrace 400 people. The biggest champions of this, when they saw the results, were the local police, because they saw a dramatic fall in burglary. Among people on the program, there was a 93% fall in burglary. And Marks and Spencers offered to sponsor a conference about harm reduction, because they were so chuffed by the fall in shoplifting. Um, and this experiment went really well. Uh, there was a woman called Julia Scott, for example, comes along. She'd been, a, she'd been prostituting herself to meet her addiction. She stopped. Her life got a lot better. And John started to talk about this to an American audience. 60 Minutes, which is like their equivalent to Panorama, came. They did a special. It got a huge amount of attention. And the American embassy get onto the British government, and they say, you've got to shut this down. We will not tolerate this. And the dynamic that happened to Mexico, the dynamic that's happened all over the world, happens here. John's clinic is transferred to Christian evangelicals who don't prescribe heroin. There were no deaths on the patients on the program from 1982 to 1995, the period John was in charge. In the six months afterwards, 40 of them died, including Julia Scott, the young mum who'd stopped prostituting herself. Um, but something amazing came out of that program. Uh, lots of Swiss doctors came and saw it. And, um, and I went to Switzerland to see, and it's really interesting, I think this is really important for the debate about how we change people's minds in Britain. Switzerland opened clinics that prescribed heroin, or rather got clinics to prescribe heroin. Um, and this has now been backed, this policy of legalized heroin for addicts, in two referenda in Switzerland by 70%, right? So I'm a Swiss citizen as well as a British citizen, because my dad's from there. And Switzerland is not a left-wing country, right? My grandmother got the vote in, I think, 1978, right? The, the, my gay uncle was, I think, his sexuality was decriminalized sometime about five years ago. Like, it's not a liberal country. And yet they voted to do this. And I think the way they did it is really interesting and important. And by the way, in their program, where you can go and see it, they've had the same massive fall in crime, massive street crime, prostitution, HIV transmission. The figures are mind-blowing. Um, 
And there was something really interesting about before I talk about the political communication, it was something that really struck me about the programme, which I hadn't known before. Sometimes there's a polarisation in this debate between abstinence people and kind of harm reductionists, and you get this debate where some people say, well, we want people to get clean, and other people say, uh, you know, it sounds almost like there's an argument saying, well, they should be on these drugs forever. It's a really interesting thing they discovered in these Swiss clinics, which is, um, so when you turn up, when you're an addict, you're assigned by the doctor, you turn up and you can set your own dose, right? And they'll give it to you indefinitely. And there is never any pressure to cut back. So in theory, the programme's existed for 20 years. You could stay on it the entire 20 years, right? But what's fascinating, the doctor in charge, Dr. Rita Mangi, said to me and explained to me and talked me through it, the vast majority of people, when they go on this programme, obviously the chaos of street use stops, the constant scrambling, the sex work, the crime, street crime, that stops. There's support to help them get jobs, to get, um, to get housing. The vast majority of people on the program just choose to cut back their dose gradually over time and eventually come off the program. There's almost no one on that program now who was on it at the start. And that was really fascinating to me. It was also really interesting. I said to Rita, um, I was telling her about Henry Smith Williams, the doctor in California, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, this has all happened before. And uh, she said something like, um, yeah, I think maybe the drug war is a bit like a relapse in addiction. You like take a step forward, you relapse, but every time you learn something new. And one of the things they've learned in Switzerland is how you communicate this to people. It's very striking. Everywhere I went where they moved beyond the drug war, one kind of argument was really unpopular and one kind of argument was really popular. What doesn't work are the libertarian arguments. I'm philosophically sympathetic to them. So saying, it's my body, I can do what I want, you, you can't tell me what to do, does not work. It didn't work when they tried with the marijuana legalization campaigns in the United States several of which at five have now been successful. Um, and it doesn't work, it didn't work anywhere. It really repels people. What does work are order-based arguments for ending the drug war. And this is what they did in Switzerland, led by Ruth Dreyfus, the incredible former president of Switzerland. What they explained to people is, the drug war means anarchy. It means unknown criminals selling unknown chemicals to unknown users all in the dark, and there is nothing we can do about it. They will spread disease, they will be disordered, they'll take over our lovely parks. The Swiss people are obsessed with their parks. Um, you know, all of that, right? And legalization is a way of restoring order to this anarchy and chaos. It's a way of taking it out of the diseased public sphere and into these nice sterile clinics where they're not going to bother you and they're not going to be criminals, and we will get order back. Now, I'm sure there's all sorts of things in that argument that are not particularly congenial to some of us. Um, although there's a huge amount of truth in it, I think, it's, I think it is true. Um, and it worked, you know, that's how they won um, legalization in Switzerland. Um, I just want to talk about uh, two other things very quickly. One of the things that, uh, which I think has, um, how, is an important part of how we think about the debate. The thing I learned that most surprised me, so the broad contours of why the drug war's gone wrong, I, obviously I learned a lot of detail and I met lots of amazing people, but the broad contours of why that went wrong I knew before I set out. Although, I, as I say, I learned a huge amount more. Um, the thing that really blew my mind that I knew nothing about, or very little about, was actually how, how deeply we've misunderstood the causes of addiction. Um, and I guess the... The, the best way to explain that is, you know, if you had said to me four years ago, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were a little bit simple-minded. And I would have said, well, heroin causes heroin addiction. We think that if the first 20 people on this row, if we all used heroin together for long enough, by the end of it, we'd all, our body would have, because there are chemical hooks in heroin, our body would have a physical craving for that drug. We would need the drug, and that's what addiction is. First thing that led to me to the fact that something not right about that is when Gabor Mate, a doctor in Vancouver, explained to me, if any of us step out onto the street today, uh, at the end of this, and you say you step out on the street and you're hit by a car and you break your hip, you'll be taken to hospital. It's very likely and you'll be given a lot of diamorphine. Diamorphine is heroin. It's much stronger heroin than you'd score on the streets because it's medically pure, right? If what we think about addiction is right, if the chemical hooks are the driver, if the thing, you, physical, you, what should, what should happen? A lot of those people, or at least some of them, should leave as addicts. You will have noticed that there's lots of studies of this that doesn't happen. My grandmother was not turned into a junkie by her hip replacement operation, right? Something else must be going on. And when I learned that, I just found that really hard to get my head around, because I, I could see it was true, but it was... Until I went and interviewed Bruce Alexander, who's a professor in Vancouver, and uh, as I say, he was an extraordinary person. And Bruce explained to me the theory of addiction that we have 
comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're really simple experiments. When you go home, you can do them yourself if you're feeling a little bit sadistic. Um, you get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and one is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat's almost always going to prefer the drugged water and it's almost always going to kill itself. So there you go, that's our theory of addiction. Bruce came along in the 70s and said, hang on a minute, we're putting the rat in an empty cage, it's got nothing to do except use these drugs, let's do this differently. So Bruce built Rat Park, which is a totally different cage. It's basically heaven for rats, right? Anything a rat could want, it's got in Rat Park. It's got cheese, it's got coloured balls, it's got uh, uh, tunnels, it's got loads of friends, it can have loads of sex. And it's got both the water bottles. It's got the drugged water and the normal water. But here's the fascinating thing. In Rat Park, the rats don't like the drugged water. They hardly ever use it. None of them ever use it in a way that looks compulsive. None of them ever overdose. What Bruce says, and there's a really interesting human example that by coincidence was happening at the same time, I'll get to in a sec, but what Bruce says is, this shows both the right-wing and left-wing theories of addiction are wrong. The right-wing theory is, you know, it's a moral failing. You're a hedonist, you're indulging yourself. And the left-wing theory is you're hijacked, your brain is taken over. And Bruce says, it's not, it's not your morality, it's not your brain. To a much larger degree than we've understood up to now, it's your cage. Addiction is an adaptation to your environment. At the same time that Bruce was doing this experiment, there was actually a really useful, if awful, human experiment going on. It was called the Vietnam War. 20% of American troops in Vietnam were using loads of smack. And if you look at the reports from the time, they're really worried because they think, my God, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of junkies on the streets of the United States when the war ends because they believe you know, that theory of addiction. Again, these troops were studied when they came home. What happened? They didn't go to rehab. They didn't get any treatment. They just stopped. Overwhelming majority, 95%, just stopped. Because if you're taken out of a hellish pestilential jungle where you don't want to be and you could die at any moment, and you go back to your nice life in Wichita, Kansas with your friends and your family, it's like being taken out of that first cage and being put into the second cage. You, don't, you want to be present in your life. Um, there's a, I think there's huge implications. There's, Obvious implications for the war on drugs from this, right? Um, I went in Arizona out with a, a group of women who were forced to wear T-shirts saying I was a drug addict and made to go out on a chain gang and dig graves and be jeered at by members of the public. And afterwards, I went, I went back with them and uh, we went into the... Uh, I said to the guards, it was actually the second day, I said to the guards, can I see the solitary confinement unit where a lot of the women are put? If they do ridiculously trivial things. And they took me and they showed me this, they call it the hole, the hole, they showed me the hole, which is a hole. Um, and, um, and I saw these women in there and I suddenly thought, this is the closest you could ever get to a literal human recreation of that first cage that guaranteed addiction in rats. And this is what we're doing to stop them being addicted. And okay, that's an extreme example, but we, if disconnection and being cut off is one of the main drivers of, of addiction, how crazy that we respond to addicts by imposing more suffering and cutting them off more, and then we're surprised that, like Billie Holiday, they can't stop. So there's implications for drug policy, obviously. It helps you to understand why Portugal has been so successful, because it's all about reconnecting them. It's all about getting them into a better cage, improving their cage. Actually, I think there's implications much wider than that. Um, you know, we've created a society and a culture where for a lot of the people we love, life is a lot more like that first cage and a lot less like Rat Park. And uh, Bruce, who did the Rat Park experiment, Bruce Alexander, says, you know, we talk a lot in addiction about um, individual recovery, and that has real value. But we need to talk much more about social recovery. You know, um, something's gone wrong with us, not just as individuals, but as a group. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think we need to think about that, you know, we can look at, I don't think it's a coincidence that Scandinavia, which has an extremely low level of poverty, disconnection, insecurity, really good workers' rights, has a very low level of addiction. And say, Arizona, which has a very high level of insecurity, virtually no welfare state, um, real stress and anxiety, even for middle class people, has a really high level of addiction. I think that tells us something. You know, I already believed in a, you know, having a more just and equal society, but if we really want to deal with addiction, 
you know, I think the facts show we have to move beyond talking about drug policy to talking about a much wider change in our culture and, and how we, how we uh, treat people. I just want to talk about one other thing. It's a slightly smaller thing, but um, something else that I think really uh, relates to the British debate uh, in, a, in a slightly odd way, which is... Um, so the, a lot of the debate about... So the first step in drug legalisation in Britain will obviously be cannabis, right? That's that, in the same way that the start of the gay rights movement. You don't argue for gay marriage at the start. You argued for gay marriage years in after you argued for lots of other things, right? It happens gradually. Uh, and clearly the first step is, 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 is cannabis and legalising that. But it's very interesting, the debate here is very fixated on, on skunk. Um, and, and in a way that I think is a total inversion of how we should be talking about it. So what you get is these right-wingers who say, uh, totally it sounds totally understandable, they say, look, cannabis isn't what it used to be. So cannabis in the 60s was much weaker, it's now extremely high in THC, skunk and super skunk. Um, and they're right, but what they fail to understand is why that's happened, and it's as a direct result of their policies. There's this thing called the iron law of prohibition, it's really simple. Uh, most popular drink in America the day before alcohol was banned was beer. Within a week of alcohol prohibition ending, most popular drink by far was beer, beer and wine. In between, beer and wine virtually disappeared. All you could get would be whiskey, moonshine, really toxic drinks, powerful drinks. And you think, well, why would that be? Why would changing, um, why would banning a drug change people's taste for the drug? It didn't change their taste, it changed, turns out, it changed what they could get hold of. If you think about it, if we had to, uh, didn't notice that there was a pub on this street, but I'm pretty sure there will be one nearby. Uh, if we had to smuggle across the country from France all the alcohol for that pub in, um, you know, in a wagon or in a truck, if we fill it with beer, we're only going to get drink for, what, 100 people? If we fill it with whiskey, we're going to get drink for loads more people, like 1,000 people, right? The, this, this happens whenever you ban something. You suddenly get a huge premium on getting the biggest possible kick into the smallest possible space. Exactly the same, so you only get the most extreme forms of the drug. Exactly the same thing happened with drug, drug prohibition. Most popular way of consuming opiates prior to them being banned was through um, syrups, uh, Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup, it was called, uh, and opium, which is much milder than heroin. When it's banned, they disappear. No one's even heard of them. Most popular way of consuming cocaine-themed products by far was coca tea. Coca-Cola is called that for a reason. They just disappear when cocaine is banned. And then when you get an even stronger crackdown in the 80s led by Reagan on co powder cocaine, what do you get? You get an even more potent form of cocaine, crack. That's how it's invented. It's a product of the iron law of prohibition. The same thing has happened with cannabis. Most people who want to smoke cannabis don't want to smoke super skunk or skunk, right? In the same way, if we go into the hypothetical pub somewhere near here, you know, most people would be drinking beer and wine. You'd be surprised if people were drinking vodka in the middle of the day and no one would be drinking absinthe, right? Even though they could be, right? Um, so we've got to if you're concerned about the fact that skunk has become the dominant form of cannabis in Britain, and you should be, the solution is to make much milder forms of the drug, the milder forms of the drug that almost all users want, available. We can do that. We can only do that in a legalised and regulated trade. We can't do that in, um, in the situation we have now. Anyway, that's the general thoughts I have. Sorry they were slightly random, but uh, thank you very much. Cheers.